to Ion Literature. This is Professor Michael Manassian podcasting from Fort Lauderdale, Florida in Broward County. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Michael Cleary about his poetry and the writing process. Dr. Cleary teaches full-time in the English department on BCC's central campus. He grew up in Glens Falls, New York a city which is profiled in Look Magazine's 1944 series, Hometown USA. His first poem was published over 20 years ago by the Texas Review, and since then his poetry has appeared widely in journals and college anthologies. He's a two-time recipient of the Florida Arts Grant in Poetry and a featured lecturer for the National Endowment for the Humanities. His first book of poetry was entitled Hometown USA, which was published as the 1992 winner of the American Book Series Award by the San Diego Poets Press. His second book, Halfway Decent Sinners, appeared in 2006 from Custom Words and was the winner of the Palmanach Poetry Award. He lives in Fort Lauderdale with his wife, Carol. Well, Professor Cleary, welcome to today's podcast. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you here. Let's start by talking a little bit about the process of writing poetry. When you sit down to write, do you have a definite idea for a poem, or do you wait for some kind of inspiration? I have a definite idea, um, normally a scrap of an idea, literally sometimes scraps of paper, a memory will come to me that uh, I don't understand exactly, or I, I want to explore and get to the bottom of. Uh, some things uh, come out of newspaper articles. I'll see something that interests me that isn't a personal uh, recollection, but has some sort of explorative uh, intrigue for me. Um, sometimes uh, well, it will always come from something written down, mm -hmm. at least in a rough draft. Uh, uh, a few lines sometimes, sometimes a whole page scrawled with just a stream of consciousness um, uh, exploration of that idea. But there's always something solid right. when I start with. I, I never understood how anyone can sit down and wait for the inspiration to hit them, yeah. although I know they do. Do you keep a journal of any kind? I don't. No. Okay. Uh, how about the revision process? What happens when you're, uh, let's say you've got an idea for a poem and you've uh, written some things down, what happens to it uh, from that point on? Everything with me is revision. I'm, I'm, I'm either slow or thorough. I maybe maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I've never written a poem, even a short one, that was less than 100 drafts. Uh, I keep the drafts and number them because I uh, can go back and recollect where I was sometimes 10 drafts ago. I right. go down a path and explore it and it doesn't lead anywhere and then I have to start back from another point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, revision is everything for me. And whoever said the genius is in the revision is somebody I agree with. Uh, my first efforts, the first 10 or 20 drafts, are woefully poor. Mm -hmm. uh, they look like prose that I split up on the page with no musical reason or rhythm, uh, and they're they're almost embarrassing. I very rarely would, would let anyone see them, but I need them as a starting point, and then go from there. And right. as with most writers, find that the poem takes you in surprising directions mm -hmm. more often than not. Right. Right. Okay. Let's uh, let's start a little bit uh, by having you read a poem from your first collection, Hometown USA. Uh, this one's called At Mud Lake in the Morning. Thank you. Uh, an epigraph begins this poem. That's a quote from another source. Uh, this is in reference to what I was saying about sometimes seeing something in a newspaper that isn't biographical but, but sparks an interest. And I'll read the epigraph. It was from the Associated Press. And the byline was from Mud Lake, Idaho. And a portion of that article said the following. 3,000 rabbits were rounded up and clubbed to death Saturday by about 800 men and boys during the rabbit population boom that occurs about every 10 years. At Mud Lake in the morning, boys squint into the ache of sun ricocheting off fresh snow, feel the tingle of violence in their father's tense smiles and rough jokes, sense that this is a big, and grown-up thing to be proud and fearful on the edge of a man's world, waiting for jackrabbits to be driven 
under the nervous bats and clubs they heft and slap into leathered palms to know the unfamiliar power of pain and death. Too soon the rabbits come, a stampede of darting, dodging terror as men and boys strike clumsily until they find the fierce and ancient fury in heavy thuds and hollow cracks and the rabbits start to go down, some sudden and still, smaller than alive, others jerking, scrambling on their sides, changing snow into a crazy quilt of scarlet specks and patches of deeper red. With dusk, deeds grow, bold and large on distant farms, until each boy has vanquished ten times ten, again and then again, in warrior tales told to hearthbound mothers washing bloody socks and splattered overalls in their mother's mother's kitchens. Fathers smoke quietly with measured pride as sisters, hostile and aloof, retreat into wary corners. At night, boys wriggle slowly into sleep, happiness wound tight inside, wonder at the thrill of wood on bone, snow soiled with matted fur and bloody boot prints, wonder where blood goes when the snow melts, wonder how long ten years will be and how they can stand the waiting. Really nice poem. Uh, well, the poem starts with an epigraph, as you said. Uh, so the first question is, what came first, the epigraph or the poem? The epigraph definitely came first. Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved with BB guns, and I grew up in the mountains uh, where I wasn't a great hunter at any degree, but we did things like that, hunted squirrels and birds. and So I knew something about the fun of conquering rather than killing. Uh, an animal that uh, that is a, perhaps has a bit of difficulty. So I identify a little bit, maybe a guilty pleasure of of knowing this thrill that can come with violence that maybe with adulthood you look back on and aren't too proud about. Right. right. But I identify with what happened rather than the event, than participating in that myself. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, is there any point uh, in this poem where you thought you might have been too limited by the epic? I don't think so. I think the opposite is probably true. It freed me to imagine uh, the course of a day. It, obviously, the sequence goes from morning uh, to, to evening to the boys going to sleep. And I think it freed me up to imagine it. If it had been my own experience, you tend sometimes to be limited by the truth of that experience, mm -hmm. even though you often wander outside the, the reality of what happened. So I think it freed me up to, to create a scene where mothers were washing clothes right. and sisters were appearing nervous and inferior somehow. Um, whether those things happened in those places, I don't know. But I wasn't obligated to tell the truth of the incident, just right. the truth of the feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to me, uh, as I've read this poem, that there, there's almost a, a different mood uh, once the hunt is over, that there's a slight change in the mood of the poem. Did you feel that way when you were writing it? Did you, was that your intention? It wasn't my intention. I, I think I see what you're talking about there. It becomes a more um, universal, sort of the outside looking in at the observation. I think perhaps what you mean is, um, as I see it, the, the first part is the action of it. And right. then after the death, there's a sort of reflection. Right. Uh, and I feel myself perhaps uh, stepping back from the poem a little bit more, getting out of the action and watching. Mm -hmm. the responses of the mother and the father and the daughter and the sister. Yeah. How did you actually arrive at the ending of that poem? Was that part of, all part of your revision process? All part or? of the revision right, process. Right. When I started, I had I had the epigraph. Actually, I had a fuller article, of course. I mm -hmm. took a piece of it uh, to, to locate the poem in time and, uh, and place. But it all came through revision. And uh, the end of that poem has one of those uh, gifts from the writing gods, uh, the line about uh, I was working with this rhythm of wondering this, wondering that, wondering mm -hmm. that, and ending up with wondering, you know, what it will be like in ten years now that they've had the experience, they'll be able right. to have it again, or have it with their sons. And uh, but the line that that uh, just just flew into me as a part of that was wonder where blood goes when the snow melts. Mm -hmm. And I like yeah. the literalness of that, 
because you know the texture of snow, the color mm -hmm. of blood, and right. the rest of it. And that one just came. It was part of this wonder series, mm -hmm. and uh, so that that kind of wrapped the poem up nice. But I I think I got on the idea of ending with the full circle of the ten year cycle that the epigraph identified, right. and then coming back again that this isn't a one time only mm -hmm. uh, experience. And actually, I did see a PBS. Uh, thing years later, must have been ten years later, of the same situation in Mud Lake, Idaho. Oh, right. and so it does occur yeah. as a as a recurring mm -hmm. threat. Uh, someone once said that the end of a poem should always be a surprise. Do you agree with that? Um, as I agree with most things that have truth in them, up to a point. So I'm equivocating. A, uh, was a Frost who said, "No surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader." Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm a little unsure if I agree with that 100%. Um, certainly, it's it's not a surprise after you've written as many drafts as I have. Right. So perhaps that takes some of the surprise out of it for me. The direction probably, in my case, is more more often the surprise mm -hmm. um, rather than the actual tying up of the poem. Right. So it's not really a surprise to you, but it. I guess that after maybe it's drafts, a surprise it can't be a surprise anymore. Right. Yes. Well, yes, right. perhaps. Yeah. Yes. And maybe that surprise happened in draft 50, mm -hmm. you know, but it wasn't done yet, and the wording wasn't right, and the good that gift of the gods maybe hadn't come to me, but I, but I knew it wasn't a surprise anymore that I was going to end mm -hmm. on the 10-year cycle concept and a kid going to sleep thrilled with prospect. Right. right. Okay. Uh, let's let's uh, look at another poem from that same collection. Uh, this one is called the Palmer Method. Or oh, that's the short title right there. Uh, why don't you read this for us? Okay. This is called The Palmer Method Comes to a Catholic School. Uh, this was a cursive writing uh, workbook that uh, many people across the country uh, learned their writing from, and then certainly I did. And I did go to a Catholic school. The refrain of round, round, up and down comes from the Palmer Method. They would have these expressions that the uh, person uh, directing the, the uh, work sheets would repeat these mm -hmm. uh, expressions. And that was one that I remembered. And uh, so it works its way in the poem. So I guess the, the listener would have to know why that keeps recurring. Round, round, up and down. The nuns spread a new kind of word, visions of handwriting grace. Round, round, up and down. Fountain pens circled the air, eager for cursive flight. A flock of F's, a murmuration of M's, a gaggle of G's. Round, round, up and down. All the long year long we practice for perfection. Endless rosaries of O's, scapulars hung with H's, T's like Calvary crosses lined across the page. Round, round, up and down. And when we looked up, girls were busting out all over junior high in fuzzy sweaters and tight skirts, sashaying down the halls to some secret rhythm of bulges, bumps, curves. Round, round, up and down. Boobs, nipples, tits, ass. Boobs, nipples, tits, ass. Our notebooks filled with the wicked strokes. Each word a caress, forbidden wonders smuggled into our beds. Round, round, up and down. Boobs, nipples, tits, ass. Boy flesh bursting at the seams. Prayers of love, angels writhing through mortal dreams. Great. Uh, of course, that poem uses humor quite a bit, so it's really a contrast to, to the first poem that you read. Um, I guess this is based on a real life experience. <laughs> yeah, it is. Probably the majority of my work is based uh, to some degree on biography. Um, and that was, a, those were, that was a year we went through this Palmer method. And, and of course, the connection between adolescence and puberty wasn't apparent at the time, right. you know, and I think that's why when I write about the past so much, I was too dumb or too too involved with experiences uh, to understand what was happening. And that, you know, we write about the past, I'm sure it's the same right. with yourself. You're kind of unraveling 
what was going on? Wasn't that a crazy uh, year? Wasn't that a crazy thing? And things worked out in that poem. When you see it on the page, the, um, the repetitions of O's and T's and P's, right. um, it, it's kind of a nice reflection of the Palmer method itself, where you would be writing a whole line of P's, a whole line of T's, a whole line of S's. And so to get those in the poem, it also, of course, were girlish uh, uh, figures e mm -hmm. emerging, but also the, the letters themselves were a reflection of the Palmer method. There's one where, I, I can't remember, it was quite a while ago I wrote that poem, but I can't remember when the, the selection of the words became so important to me for that reason. But at some point it did. And, and it just worked just right. Sometimes things have a way of dovetailing right. perfectly. And I think they dovetail in there as well. Yeah. Were, were you surprised by anything in this poem? Um, again, I th one of the things that surprised me is I didn't know how far to take the language that some right. people might not see as funny and adolescent guy uh, language, the boobs and nipples and all that. Mm. And um, I think perhaps at first uh, I may have danced around a little bit or not had as much or not, right. had, not had been, maybe perhaps didn't repeat it as often. Mm. The repetition becomes a little bit of an echo of the round, round, up and down, and right. you know, this right. kind of this echo exactly. uh, of themselves, an echo to an echo to an echo. And so I knew it was right then, mm -hmm. and that is in so many things. If it's true, and you know, it doesn't have to appeal to everybody, right. uh, and right. I don't expect to please everybody, but um, adolescence, in my mind, was filled with girls mm -hmm. and filled with puberty, and this poem had to be filled with it as well. So, right. so I know I, I marched forward uh, from that point and said, well, I, this is what it's about, so I have to be, uh, you know, I have to use, I do right. really use that language, and, and not be apologetic about mm -hmm. it to the reader. Sure. And well, I love the humor gets it across to the reader um, a little bit. As well. Yeah, I think I think it does. I think you've got just the right amount in there. Um, I imagine, you know, in my own mind, I'm, I'm imagining uh, you write, sitting and writing, and behind you is standing the phantom <laughs> of a nun with her ruler out, just ready to <laughs> whack you if you put one too many tit or ass in this poem. So <laughs> I think you got the, the right balance there. Exactly Thanks. Right. That's a great so. way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Terrific. Uh, let's let's turn to your other book of poems, your most recent book, um, Halfway Decent Sinners. And there's uh, a few poems in here that uh, we might want to pull out. Um, I've marked some pages there, and I'm just going to let you quickly go through. And oh, I, you've got one already. So <laughs> right ahead. Uh, were you thinking of this one or that one? Uh, the one, uh, yeah, right? yeah well, I, I guess I'm fascinated by these nuns also. Yeah, I'm not Catholic, but I remember going to uh, CYO dances for our listeners and watchers, uh, viewers. That was Catholic youth, youth organization. That was a mm -hmm. Catholic school uh, about a block away from my house, St. Mary's in uh, Dumont, New Jersey. And I used to go to the CYO dances, and the nuns would actually go walk around with rulers. Mm -hmm. To make sure that you weren't too close to your dancing partner. So, uh, anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, that's fun. But my uh, school is called St. Mary's Academy, so uh, in a different place in New York State. Uh, this one is called, again, the language, uh, you know, kind of is right out there. It's called Sister Lardass, which makes it a good title if a title achieves the curiosity of the reader, I think. Right. It's, of course, playful, but perhaps it's a little. Uh, a little surprising as well. We all were giving ourselves nicknames all through high school, and uh, the nuns had a male name and a female name, and I remember this woman, this uh, nun's uh, name, but I don't use it in the poem. I put some other possibilities for it. But the initials were L and A, so, and she was very hefty, so this is Sister Lardass, and the title goes into the first line. Uh, we did an awful lot of repetition and copying and busy work mm -hmm. at St. Mary's, along with the Palmer Method, things right. like that. Repetition. Sister Lardass, we called her, one of those squat, heavy ones you saw more of than the stocky kind, but also for the letters beginning her names. Sister Louis Alexis, or Lawrence Ann, or such. A nun's amalgamated name to prove she came from a loving father and mother, same as us, not hatched in the convent from a bitter black egg. The first of three deep blackboards would be filled when we dumb scriveners entered the room, and before we copied it, 
up it slid and she kept on going, page after page, filling our notebooks, sentences piling up into paragraphs, multiplying madly like loaves and fishes from hell, so on tests we could give it back, word for word for word for goodness sake, all over again, like opposite facing mirrors in a barber shop, images repeating themselves to themselves into infinity, and God only knows how or why. Yeah, you really get the sense of, of the classroom in this poem, I think. Uh, what it was like to be sitting there, uh, it doesn't have to be a Catholic school, certainly. I remember repetition in my, uh, in my uh, elementary school and middle school years, uh, constantly writing and rewriting the same thing over and over again. Yes, it creates a kind of a desperation. You asked me about the other ones about a surprise. That one just happens. That image of a barbershop mirror mm -hmm. was a surprise to me. Right. I was trying to talk about the, you know, the endless repetition, mm -hmm. and it came to me when a male's in a barbershop, I don't know if the viewing callers do the same thing, but we have that mirror behind you, right. and you see yourself repeated uh, mm -hmm. into infinity. That was a surprise, and it was a nice place to end the poem yeah. with God owning this how or why in right. a religious situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, obviously, you've been mining your childhood for, for a good poem. It's a good thing it's your childhood, not somebody else's. Uh, and and uh, I think, again, you get a real sense of what it was like to grow up in that particular time. I'm not sure if students today have to go through that kind of repetition uh, learning process that, that you and I did um, back then. I hope they don't. Yeah. I hope they don't. It doesn't accomplish much about after multiplication day All right. Uh, ha have you ever uh, gone back to uh, Glens Falls, and uh, uh, have you had any contact with any one of your teachers or classmates? Classmates, yes. I have lifelong friends that, that still visit me in Florida and always have. And, uh, and I go back each year a lot. My family is still there, my mother is still there, my sister is still in town. Right. So it's at least once a year I do get back. Um, and uh, we, we had a, this small parochial school only had a hundred, less than a hundred seniors in it. Uh, so there was a chance to know a lot of people, and, right. uh, and in a smallish town like that, uh, over the years, there's about 10 or 11 people that, mm -hmm. that I'm always in contact with, and, and who come down here. So um, we were formed by that experience a lot, right. uh, and, um, and I think we still are trying to figure it out for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Many people are still very fervent Catholics, and right. a number of us are not, um, but we all went through the same, uh, the same uh, torment of the nuns from time to time. And, but it creates it created a lot of, as you said, mining that opportunity, right. that tension and the stress and, the, and the, uh, the, the power exerted against you and your rebellion against power. There's a lot of the boyish shenanigans in here are, are clearly rebellions against the, the repression, you feel, right. uh, both religiously and, and in a classroom situation. So I, I always feel I'm grateful for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what, I've lost a lot of material. Right. Yeah. Uh, it is the St. Mary's Academy, is it still there? It's still there, but uh, it only goes up to 8th grade now. Mm -hmm. And the reason was the, the nuns were not in, um, the teaching nuns, you know, sort of have disappeared over time. Right. And, uh, and when I, that was a school, the academy went from kindergarten all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. So you were in that same building uh, your whole, you know, your whole academic life if you stayed. And uh, I remember maybe in junior high, the first, um, non nun who was a teacher, yeah. and then there was a second one, and I think there were just two, and then it, after I left, and I graduated in 63, um, there were more lay teachers, more lay teachers, and then eventually it just collapsed though, uh, from the lack of right. teaching nuns. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's switch gears a little bit uh, and read one more poem. Uh, if we could uh, turn to uh, Second Marriage Polka, that sure. would be a nice way to wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think this perhaps because it illustrates that not everything I write about is about growing up in my childhood. Right. This is a, a fairly um, a recent poem. 
Uh, on the page, uh, the poem starts off normally from, uh, from margin to margin, and then there is a stanza that it centers itself in the middle, uh, suggesting a kind of a gracefulness on the page because the scene is graceful. And then the following stanza is very ragged. The lines are very, very uh, scattered, and that's to suggest um, clumsiness. So with that as a prelude, perhaps um, uh, indicates what I was trying to show about the moment and how sometimes the lines of a poem can be instructive to a reader. Mm -hmm. Second marriage, polka. A gathering of clans, German and Irish. Strange rememberings, never lasting vows long ago when how so in love they were with others. Her family claps for a polka. A brother joins her and each cocks a leg, a pause to begin. Then, whoosh, a swoop into the first step, hippity hop, heel and toe, and away they go. One foot chasing the other, chasing the other, gallop to glide, to waltz, to whirl, perfectly together. He watches, amazed, applauds her light-footed steps, so far beyond what he can see now, so perfectly awful. His dull shuffle through slow dances, or worse, his vague commotion struggling against the beat of fast songs, and either way, her, a tar-footed gull, stuck with his dopey feet. The accordion wheezes into a slow song. She comes to him, arms open from embrace, on her face the flaxen glow of the gloaming. He lets go, lets himself feel her loveliness grace his clumsy heart, like some fluky penguin astonished with flight. When they move, they move together. He curves into her like shadow. She bends to him like light. Great, really nice poem. Uh, somehow, when you were reading uh, towards the end of the poem, uh, I was hearing in the back of my mind Round and round, <laughs> up and, and it was just it really kind of fit nicely. There's a lot of uh, motion I notice in all these poems. A lot of action, a lot of action verbs, uh, a lot of motion going on, and uh, it's really nice uh, uh, the way that poem sort of fits fits into the end too. Um, it's too bad that people listening or watching can't see the way the poem is arranged on the page, because I think that's really an important point, uh, especially to uh, students who are interested in writing. Uh, it, you know, a lot depends on how you arrange the lines and the words on the page uh, in a poem. It's a very important uh, um, aspect of it, I think. Um, I guess I don't have to ask you where you got the inspiration for this poem, but I will ask you, were you surprised at anything in this poem? Um, the bird imagery came, uh, came to me at some image, uh, at some point in the revision process. It starts off with uh, um, her like a uh, tar-footed gull, um, you know, being stuck with my dopey feet, and then it ends up with the uh, the thing about the um, like a geez, I forgot the line myself, the um, pelican uh, or the uh, penguin line. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize that. I, I mean, it was in the poem, right. and it surprised me afterwards that it would, now it works. I could take credit for some parallelism there, that the freedom of a, of a penguin, which of course can't fly, which is right. a flightless bird, but with my wife's grace and her dancing mm -hmm. uh, ability, she could kind of carry me along or bring me into flight uh, with her uh, like some lucky uh, penguin. Uh, that, that was definitely a surprise, and I thought, mm -hmm. maybe you know, I always know that the subconscious is, has a lot to do with, right. with suggestiveness in poetry, and that it probably was there at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't set out to do a, a clumsy bird, and uh, a clumsy bird made graceful in the end, or making different birds. Uh, somebody pointed out to me, uh, maybe somebody reviewed the book, uh, mentioned that the dark and the light images at the end, the, the combination of um, the darkness with me and the lightness mm -hmm. with her. That that's a that's a penguin too. Right. You know, yeah, I had no, I hadn't thought of that. Right. And I thought, well, you know, I'll take credit <laughs> for it, uh, even if it wasn't intentional. Maybe it was subconsciously uh, intentional. Right. Okay. Right.
Well, I think uh, that's uh, all we'll put you through today. Really appreciate your uh, sharing your poetry with us and, and your comments about poetry and writing. That's the end of today's podcast. This is Professor Michael Manassian uh, reminding you to keep your eye on literature.